it recording? Yep. Yes, it is. You it is? Look, okay. It's gotten that upper corner. I've never hosted one. I've been in many. Okay. So you can see my screen. Cool. So let's go there. So Paradigm 26, the name of the business. Um, this is me. So um, my name's Camden. Um, I am friends with a mutual acquaintance of, uh, or a mutual friend of Carrie and I. Um, that's how the two of us got to uh, be where we are here right now, working together. Um, so yeah, a little background. I was the MA, the medical assistant at Northwest Foot and Ankle um, with Dr. Ray McClanahan, a uh, podiatrist, um, the inventor of correct toes. Uh, if you haven't heard of those, they're just little toe spreading devices. Um, I've got them on my feet right now. And uh, I'll talk about those more later. Um, essentially, as, podi as far as podiatry clinics go, it is different than 99.9% .9 of them. Um, the traditional podiatry clinic is going to talk to you about essentially like one of four things, uh, a cortisone injection, uh, come back when it hurts so much, too much, and we'll do surgery, arch support, or kind of do nothing, which we would see a lot of the people who had tried that model. And unsurprisingly, it didn't always work for them. Um, so we, instead of trying to put a band-aid on things we actually try to unravel the issue and figure out why it was happening in the first place and that kind of led to this next line of i learned so much about the human foot and body especially how important a natural toe and foot alignment are to the foot and body's health essentially right i'll say it a bunch of times our feet are our foundation if we do weird things to our toes and feet weird things happen up the rest of the body to compensate. So, um, you know, the toe is connected to the foot and so on. Okay. And then I also learned all the issues of traditional shoes. Um, you know, I'm not positive how we got here with shoes, um, but most of what today's uh, kind of talk will be about is why traditional shoes, and when I say traditional shoes, just, you know, think of shoes that you're used to seeing, um, Nike, New Balance, High Heels, uh, Dance Co's, all the issues that those shoes cause in the human foot. Um, and please do, uh, Carrie, we talked about this. Um, if anyone has a question, absolutely just uh, chime in and interrupt me. That'll be great. It's way more fun to talk about this than to, uh, kind of just lecture. Um, or if you're more comfortable, you can just put uh, a question in the chat, because I assume I'll get a little pop up about the chat. Um, if you put something in the chat, and I don't do anything, then just say something. Okay, so that's me. So traditional shoes 101. So the three shoes we've got here, we've got the New Balance tennis shoe. Uh, on the top right, we've got a dance co clog. And then the bottom right, we've got a high heel. So most people know, or at least have an inkling that high heel shoes aren't really that good for the body. Um, or at least many people know when they put high heel shoes on, they don't necessarily feel that great on their body. Um, however, you know, a high heel is just an extreme of the New Balance has all the same features that this high heel has. The New Balance heel is higher, and same with the Dance Co. The heel is higher, the toes are lifted up in the air, and the toes are pinched. So all three of these shoes have all of the components that a traditional shoe in today's kind of westernized world has. Um, and they're all really not that very, not very good for us. Um, so that's kind of 101 is, Heel elevation, so any amount of your heel being higher than your toes, or more specifically, the ball of your foot, any amount of your toes being lifted up. So you can see this is, and we'll talk about it in a second, toe spring. You can see the toes are coming off the ground on all three of these shoes. And then a big one, right, is the toe box. Instead of being wide, it is 
narrow, pinching those toes. And then the dance co clog is a really, really good uh, um, example of a shoe that is super stiff. Uh, you can't bend those shoes. Like however hard you try and twist them, they don't move. They're just a solid brick. Um, the New Balance a little less so, but lots of tennis shoes these days are just going for, I don't want your foot to move. So they just build up uh, stiffness. So that's kind of just traditional shoes 101 of the kind of components. So to kind of break down those components a little more, heel elevation. So again, high heels, right? Obviously the heel is really high, uh, but a really important point is healthy shoes, what people often think of as healthy, like uh, an athletic shoe, like that New Balance or like that Nike or like that Brooks, almost all of them are gonna have some amount of heel elevation. So, right, when we elevate the heel, the calf gets a little shorter. That's kind of the, I think one of the main reasons people wear high heels is A, you get to be a little taller, um, but B, it contracts the calf. So it, I think that's kind of one of the aesthetics is that your calf looks nice because it's, it's being contracted. Now that kind of gets to the point of why the first thing here is shortens the calves. If we use a muscle in a shortened state and just keep using it like that over and over and over again, i.e. walking and shoes with heel elevation, muscles are, they have plasticity. They will change length depending on what length we put them into. So the calf will literally shorten its length because we put it on a shortened length so much. Um, that's why almost literally every person I talk to has short or tight calves because we're walking around shortening them all day, every day when we have shoes on. So the calf gets short and tight. To keep your foot on the ground, right? If my heel goes up, my toes relatively still stay flat on the ground. So that is effectively lifting the toes up, right? So if you're standing, if you get up onto your toes, your toes still stay flat on the ground. But to do that, the toes effectively have to lift up, if that makes sense. So essentially heels are doing this. It's not just lifting the backside, it's lifting the, the toes as well. And then the rest of the body has to compensate for this weird position we put ourselves in. So with a, you know, if I have a couple inch heel, I'm not just tilted forward, I'm still standing straight up and down. So what that's telling me is that other parts of the body are making adaptations to keep me erect standing straight up and down, right? So our tibia, one of our lower leg bones is sitting on top of our ankle bone in a different position than it normally wants to be. And that position is inherently less stable and strong. And then my hips and lower back spine are making postural changes again. So I'm standing straight up and down rather than tilted forward because of that heel elevation. So heel elevation, um, some common foot ailments that you might have heard of that are largely due to this, um, to heel elevation. Hammer toes, right? That's where the toes are kind of sitting like this. Plantar fasciitis is a big one. Um, at a later talk at some point, we will probably talk about the distinction between plantar fasciitis, fasciosis. Um, really quickly though, itis, inflammation, osis, dead necrotic tissue. Um, a study, well, I guess I'll, I'll just do a little tangent here. Uh, a study came out where they took biopsies of 50 people who had plantar fasciitis and all 50 of them, there was no inflammation in that tissue. There was dead tissue. So what that was telling them is there isn't inflammation going on. There is a lack of blood supply. Um, so we put the foot into a bad position, stretch the plantar fascia, and then we cut off the blood supply um, another, another study shows when we put the big toe into a shoe position, the artery that feeds that plantar fascia gets cut off by 20%. So we, like I said, we stretch the fascia and upset it, and then it can't get blood in there because we constrict the artery by pushing that big toe over. Um, if any of that made sense. Uh, an, another talk I'm hoping to kind of go over the four or five or six kind of most common foot ailments that we see kind of in Western culture. Um, almost all of them are due to common, the shoes that we wear. 
And then capsulitis is the, the ball, the foot, the joints there get upset. Um, this is actually a really good picture for it is, actually I'll scroll back up. So if we look at this picture here, the high heel, the toes are up in the air and the heel is up in the air. So the only thing really contacting the ground is the ball of your foot. So the, all the weight's going to the ball of the foot. And then we're also lifting so that it's really exposed. Um, so capsulitis is super common because we're not only overloading those joints, but we're exposing them. And let me see, any questions? I guess I should pause between, um, is there a way for me to see everyone else? There we go. Okay, heel elevation making sense? Okay, so toe spring is, I'll move you guys down here. Oh, how do I do, there we go. Toe spring is what we, so you can see the toes kind of pop up in the front of this shoe. So instead of my, my foot being flat on the ground, the toes are being lifted up. So it's essentially furthering what happens when we lift our heel, it's just furthering that. And it makes this kind of rocker foot. Um, the, kind of the rocker sole is where this toe spring came from is where first we elevated the heel and people were kind of scuffing their toes. So they're like, oh, we'll just lift the toes so that you can rock through when you walk. Except we're holding our foot in this position, which is, causes a host of issues. Um, such as it shortens the extensor muscles on the front of the shin. So the, the heel elevation shortens the muscles on the back of the leg, the calf, and shortens the extensor muscles. And then the toe spring just shortens those extensors even more. So we just have two muscle groups on the back and the front that are just getting pulled short and tight. Um, so the, the toes never really get to lay flat. When we walk, the last thing to leave the ground is supposed to be our flat toes kind of leaving, leaving the ground, but they're held like this. So they do roll, but they never get to like actually push off. So we drastically change the way we walk. Our gait is changed a lot because of these things, including toe spring. Um, and toe spring, again, just contributes to all the same thing that heel elevation did. Um, those hammer toes, mallet toes, plantar fasciitis, uh, capsulitis. Um, so, and then this is a big one, right? The narrow toe box. So they squeeze the toes together, which right, I can assume most people would agree that squeezing the toes isn't necessarily a good thing, um, but it's amazing what that causes simply by squeezing the toes together. So um, common ailments, bunions, again, hammer toes, plantar fasciitis, capsulitis. It's amazing how many of these things, uh, components of shoes cause the same things. So a bunion is a, is a soft tissue imbalance. So when our toes are like this, We've got a muscle on the inside of the big toe and we've got a muscle on the outside. If my toes haven't been put into shoes, those muscles are the length that they're supposed to be. So if you go to places in the world where they don't wear shoes, they still have toes that are super spread, just like the day they were born. But if you look at this picture, right? People in westernized cultures, feet tend to look a little bit more like this. The toes are scrunched together. Um, there, this person has a, a bunion, which a bunion, the definition of that kind of depends on who you ask. Um, the main part that I think is the most important is really a bunion is just when the big toe is pushed over towards the other ones and it stays put. So you can see that this big toe is pushed over towards that second toe and the toes are just squished. Um, the bunion bump that people remark on a lot and think is kind of necessary to call it a bunion that bump is truly just a dislocation of the joint. So you can see when I put my, my 
finger like this, and this is the big toe, and this is my metatarsal bone, the bone just behind the big toe, there appears to be a little bit of a bump there. But if I put my, my big toe back out, now we've got a nice straight line. So that bunion bump is honestly just a dislocation of a joint, and that's what we're seeing. So one of the things it says here contributes to the foot over pronating. So pronating, if you're standing, is when your ankles roll in towards each other, your arches get closer to the ground. The opposite supination is when your arches get higher or your ankles roll away from each other. So if you go to a running shoe store, they'll put you up on a treadmill with a camera watching. Um, and you know, if you didn't know better, you'd think there's like a over pronating epidemic happening of like 80% of people are getting put into shoes that help prevent over pronation. Uh, and I think that's the next slide. Yeah, so I'll get into that in a second. Um, when our big toe, and you can feel this on yourself if you wanna do it now, um, or you can do it later. When your big toe is pushed over as it is in traditional shoes, the likelihood of you rolling in or over pronating is vastly increased because your base of support is narrowed. If your big toe is out where it's supposed to be, the arch is the length that it's meant to be. It inherently lifts your arch and it's much harder to over pronate because your, base, your big toe is actually out where it's supposed to be. So you have this nice wide base of support that doesn't allow you to roll in. But the moment you put those shoes on, your toes get squeezed together and it's far easier for your foot to roll into an overpronated state. Um, add on top of that, that your heel is up in the air and your toes are up in the air. It's a really wobbly surface. So it's not a big surprise that people tend to overpronate. So the, the shoe industry is going more towards arch support. And this is a common thing that you, if you went to a podiatrist and said, um, I've got plantar fasciitis or my feet are achy, they're going to give you arch support, likely. So super feet is like a, just over the counter. Um, but you know, if, you, if you go to a podiatry clinic, they're likely going to give you custom orthotics that are costing you know, four or five, six hundred dollars. Um, so what Superfeet and these podiatrists and companies like Brooks that is pictured here, what they're thinking is people are over pronating. That's bad. I know that over pronating is a bad thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some stiff material under their arch, or we're going to give them a Superfeet that puts, you know, we put that in the shoe and it literally puts stiff stuff underneath the arch so that when they start to roll, it stops them. So the issue there, let me actually look at my points here. Um, essentially, this is them trying to, well, the irony is that the shoe that you're putting your insoles in to are causing your overpronation in the first place. And then you add the insole. And yes, it will help you not to overpronate. But what that's doing is, A, you're still going to overpronate some because your foot is in such a bad position in the shoe. And then the support is gonna shut off the muscles of your feet because there's something stiff underneath them. So it's just like, you know, if I broke my arm and they put a cast on my arm, but I just never took the cast off, my arm would get pretty darn weak and I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to use it very well. Podi the podiatry world is like the one medical uh, model or area of medicine that chronically casts people. So you can essentially think of a super feet or an orthotic as a cast of sorts, right? Traditionally, right, if I broke my arm, I put a cast on it, the bone heals, I take it off, I do some physical therapy, and my arms back, I can do some stuff, you know, maybe it's a little stiff every once in a while, but really all I have to show for my, break, my broken arm is like a scar, but I can do whatever with it. In the foot world, we put a cast in your shoe so your foot doesn't move very much, and then we just leave it there. 
and the foot atrophies, the muscles atrophies, that means they get weaker and smaller. And then what this necessitates is it leads to need for more support down the road. Um, because of the patient population we saw at Northwest Foot and Ankle, we only saw a couple people like this, but we saw a few um, elderly folks who literally had not taken a step in decades without their really built up stiff shoe with their really stiff big orthotics in their shoe. Um, they literally hadn't taken a single step. Um, some of these people even have shower shoes because their feet are so atrophied and so weak because of putting so much support into their shoes that they can't even like get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom um, without putting their shoes on. So obviously that's an extreme case, but you know, we saw people in less extreme cases of they couldn't do their day to day activities unless they had their shoes on with their orthotics in. Um, it's not that arch support that I like don't believe in it. We actually we we made some custom orthotics for people. Um, anecdotally, we found that super feet were probably like 95% as effective as custom orthotics and they cost $50 instead of like 600. Um, we used Superfeet at the clinic more as a temporary aid. So someone's foot hurts. So we are going to offload that foot, offload those tissues by putting some support. But then what we would do is we'd slowly wean out of said support so that their foot doesn't become reliant on it and get weak, necessitating continued support and potentially probably more support down the line. So we used it more as kind of like I would for a cast, like I broke my arm. We temporarily put a cast on, let the tissues calm down. And then, right, how do we get tissues more resilient? We strengthen them. So we just slowly strengthen them. So as it relates to orthotics or inserts, we would just slowly wean out of it. Just essentially asking those muscles to do a little bit more every day or so until the point that they're strong enough that they don't need that support. Um, a strong foot that is aligned properly, so the toes are nice and wide, the heel is flat and level, and the toes are down on the ground, that foot doesn't overpronate. Um, and as a side note, in gait, your foot is supposed to pronate, and your foot is supposed to supinate. And if you're on uneven ground, your foot and ankle are going to be doing all sorts of crazy things. You know, there's tons of bones, joints, ligaments, and muscles in the foot because it's a super adaptable structure. You know, that's the issue with putting a bunch of rigidity underneath it is we don't get the benefits of our really adaptable feet because we just have these bricks on our feet instead of adaptability. Um, any questions? Cool. So yeah, our support I'm not against arch support. What I'm against is chronically supporting someone. Um, yeah. An abundance of cushioning. So brands like Hoka, um, Hoka's kind of leading the charge. Um, Brooks, you know, kind of traditional athletic running shoes. Where they're going these days is just putting more and more and more padding. So, what, you know, the second thing, it doesn't actually address the foot issue. At best, it covers it up. So if we just put some cushioning between your foot that has, let's say it's capsulitis, you know, the bottom of the, the joints on the ball of the foot are upset. If we just put a ton of cushioning between those upset joints and the ground, the joints probably won't tell you that they're being hurt as much. However, we haven't changed anything. The heel is still higher, the toes are still up in the air, the toes are still being squeezed, and we're putting all that pressure through those joints that are upset. Um, so usually what, what I would find is when you're know, talking with patients is they got some hokas, they felt fantastic, they could go out and be active again, but then slowly but surely over the next weeks to months, the pain crept back in and it actually was probably worse than it was before they started wearing the hokas. The reason it was worse is they were overloading the tissue even more because they, their brain wasn't able to give them the right signals because there was so much stuff between their upset joints and the ground. 
So they had this false sense of security with all this cushioning that they could go out and do things. Um, but again, they actually hadn't addressed the issue of they're overloading those joints by elevating the heel and lifting the toes and squishing the toes. Um, and then a big one is balance. So it doesn't seem like it per se, but shoes are just tiny little stilts. You know, if we kept going, so like the shoe that's pictured here, right? It's probably mm, 20, 25 millimeters of, of foam between you and the ground. But let's say it was a foot. Like at that point you would be like, oh, it's gonna be really hard to walk with that. Um, the same thing applies with 20 millimeters or 15 millimeters. The higher off the ground you are, all the nerve endings in the bottom of our feet have a harder time understanding what's happening underneath them. So we have hundreds of thousands of nerve endings on the bottom of our feet that are supposed to be getting information about where we are in space, proprioception. What is, what is the scan on the bottom of the feet? What are all the muscles? And then they send information to the brain so we can stay upright and not roll our ankle and not hurt ourselves. The more stuff we put between those hundreds of thousands of nerve endings and the ground, the more muted those signals become. And this is huge in the elderly population, right? Falls are, you know, if someone falls, the likelihood of them breaking a hip and then dying is a, a very real issue. Um, so getting people closer to the ground, uh, especially elderly folks, so that they stay upright is, is humongous. Um, so staying closer to the ground is, is very big. Um, and then from a um, uh, earthing, right? Depending on what you kind of think about this, but right, the, the earth has electricity to it. We have electricity to it. Those two things coming together and kind of interacting. Um, I can just say anecdotally, like I, at this point, being multiple years into wearing shoes with little cushioning and being barefoot all the time, um, you know, it, it, my body likes it. The human body is essentially built to like being on the ground. Um, so when we take that away, we don't necessarily know because we take it away when we are like about two years old. Um, but it's very exciting and fun to get that back. And then I haven't met a single person who starts wearing a little less cushion and is like, you know what? I'm going to go back to those really cushy shoes. I miss them. Okay. Okay. So that was kind of the shoes 101. Heel elevation, toe spring, uh, narrow toe box rigidity, arch support, and overly cushioned shoes. Any questions before I kind of move on to talking about natural shoes? Okay, sweet. So let's see. Not a whole lot of points here. They just don't have elevated heels. They don't have toe spring. They have wide toe boxes instead of narrow. And they're more flexible. They don't have a bunch of cushion. It's essentially, right, the goal here is to hold your foot in its anatomical position and keep your foot warm and help make sure that you don't, you know, step on a nail and it goes through your foot. So like warmth and protection is really all a shoe should do. Tradition, you know, the shoe industry these days is like the foot needs help. The foot is inherently weak you need to buy this special shoe for your foot so you're doing something good for your feet um which you know probably it's a bunch of bullshit <laughs> so these guys here this is a lems and these two are vivo barefoot um plenty of other shoes out there that's just a couple a couple pictures of those um however these shoes, the Vivo and the Lems, have very, very little padding. So I talked about it's good to get closer to the ground. Balance is better, proprioception is better, it just feels good. Uh, however, if we do this too fast, if we go from our usual like New Balance built up shoe right to a Vivo that has like 
four millimeters of rubber between me and the ground, the likelihood of me actually injuring myself is pretty high. Um, I don't know if you remember um, Vibram Five Fingers when they came out maybe like 15 years ago, I think. Um, they got sued because a bunch of people hurt themselves. There was a class action lawsuit and they actually settled outside of court. Uh, essentially, the, the people suing were saying, your shoes injured me. The issue is from Five Finger, very rightly, and there's way more science backing this stuff up now than there was then. Um, their claim of it will they'll make your feet stronger is like 100% true. You know, if you just put less stuff between your foot and the ground and it's less rigid, your feet will be used more, which will inherently make your feet stronger. People just didn't read the break in information and just started wearing the Vibram Five Fingers and doing their normal stuff. And a bunch of people hurt themselves because of that. It wasn't because the shoes were bad, it was, it was a training error. They essentially went from zero time in a shoe that asked their feet to do a lot to all the time. So that's where a transition shoe would come in. So the top and the bottom shoe are Ultra is the brand, A-L-T-R-A, -A, and this middle one is Topo. Um, I far prefer Ultra. Um, which I'll touch on in a second. But so essentially these shoes are, are your Brooks, are your Hoka's, except they don't have heel elevation. They have a wide toe box instead of a narrow one. Now toe spring, this is the reason why I don't like Topo as much. They tend to have a decent amount of toe spring as you can see in this middle shoe. The Ultra, you can see that there's some toe spring but on almost every single model, that toe spring is what we could just call a flexible toe spring. The moment you put your toe foot down, the, the, the front of the shoe will flatten out. So it's not actually holding your toes up in the air. Whereas Topo has often a rigid toe spring, which is what we don't want. That's gonna hold your toes up in the air. Um, now, having said that, I would, far, I would be happy if someone changed from a New Balance to a Topo. Um, because it's a, it's a step in the right direction. So what is it? Don't let good be, perfection be the enemy of good. Essentially, if we can take a step in the right direction, we should definitely do it. Um, but so the big thing with the transition shoe is it has a similar amount of padding to what most people are accustomed to. So at the clinic and people that I still work with now, most people athletic shoe wise are wearing a Brooks or a Hoka or a Nike. And these are essentially those shoes, except they just have don't have or have less of those negative characteristics that we talked about um, at the beginning. So Ultra, like I said, similar amount of padding, lacking the negative features, which is good. Essentially, it's just a less of a shock to your body because we're removing one of the, one of the variables, right? We're changing heel elevation, we're changing toe spring, we're giving more room for the toes, and we're taking away rigidity, all of which are new for your body. But instead of also getting really close to the ground, we're just gonna control that variable and leave that cushioning. So it'll just be less of a shock to the body, um, which, you know, this final point here says, allows a more seamless transition. And that's what we're looking for. We want this to be, we don't want you to get hurt and we wanna just slowly transition into these shoes and then we're good to go. And then there are shoes with less padding. So again, this is another Vivo. Um, I say ideally one begins to introduce shoes with a little less padding, though this is not absolutely required. Um, you know, I've talked to patients, they're like, do I have a tr the word, you know, the ultras are a transition shoe. Is that like one of my transitioning to? Theoretically, that's these shoes with less padding. Um, and again, we've discussed why not having much padding is a good thing. But I, I've worked with plenty of people who just get into ultras and that they stay there. It's not really a goal of theirs to start wearing less and less padded shoes. Um, you know, I talk with them about why it potentially would be a good thing, but it's a big win in my book if they change from New Balance to Ultra because um, it's holding their feet anatomically as they're meant to be held. Um, but less padding, better balance, stronger, more engaged feet. 
And then correct toes. So I said, um, the doctor who I worked with invented these guys. Um, they are toe spacers. You can essentially think of them as braces for your toes. So, right, we're going to put the spacers between the toes, spread them, and then we're going to go use the toes and feet in that spread position. So, essentially, we're going to try and reestablish the toe splay that you were born with. Because um, 99 point, you know, I don't actually have the statistics, but almost every single human is born where the, the toes are the widest part of the feet. The foot is just shaped like a wedge. It gets wider and wider and wider. And then we wear traditional shoes that come to a point and pinch our toes. So the correct toes, the, the big toe is super important as it comes to gait. 85% um, ish or so of our weight goes through the big toe when we, during our gait cycle. Um, if it's in the wrong position, we talked about over pronating. Um, Bunion formation, a lot of bad things happen if our big toe isn't where it's supposed to be. Not that I don't care about the other toes, but our primary concern is that big toe. Um, so correct toes are one of the two really important things if we're gonna try and reverse or heal or counteract the common toe foot issues we see, like a bunion. So a bunion often is thought of as a hereditary thing. Um, Again, if you go to parts of the world where they don't wear shoes, bunions don't exist. People don't have hammer toes. Um, their feet are so strong and aligned that they don't get plantar fasciitis. They don't get capsulitis. So you don't see the common foot ailments in our Western culture in cultures that don't wear shoes. Um, but to reverse a bunion, like we talked about, it's just a soft tissue imbalance. The muscle on the inside of the big toe responsible for pulling it over is really short and tight, just like our calves got really short and tight. And the muscle responsible for pulling the big toe out, it gets uh, long and weak. So this one's long, this one's short, put the correct toes in, this guy will lengthen, this guy will shorten, and then they'll be happy and the big toe's where it's supposed to be. So, uh, one of the biggest obstacles with this whole shoe world is that they're ugly. And I totally get it. <laughs> Societally, right, we have come to this conclusion that an aesthetically pleasing shoe comes to a point. And that obviously butts heads with shoes that get wide. <laughs> they, they can't coexist. Um, so that's like the biggest obstacle people run into is finding shoes that they are willing to wear. Um, so this is, you know, again, I, a lot of Vivos since they tend to be uh, more aesthetically pleasing. Um, they, pun intended, toe the line between a wide toe box and a narrow toe box. So they aren't the, like the healthiest shoe of all time as it comes to a toe box but they're way, way, way better than most shoes that people are wearing. That's why um, good, good, if you're going with Vivo, they've got their Soul of Africa line. Uh -huh. they have, that one has a wider toe box. That's what I wear. Yeah. So recently, I agree. Yep. They, um, over the last few years, um, their toe boxes have gotten wider and wider, which is definitely, um, I agree. That's actually a good point. I think part part of my kind of bias is I. Well, I mean, I, plenty of theirs are still small, but if you get the right. Soul of Africa, it's wider. Yeah, there's okay, many. Okay, cool. Most of them I can't wear because they um, don't they squeeze my forefoot too much. Right. And I, and, you know, now that I'm so used to the other type of shoe, when I wear even Vivos, it actually I get pain because I'm like, like because my I'm because of the toe big toe being smushed in and so. And right. So used to the healthy, happy zone that it goes. <laughs> but, ah, that. Kat, did you mention the, was it the Ababas? Is that the ones you're wearing? Yeah, I wear that one. And then they've got their newer one that's super cute. I've actually got it right here. Oh, cool. Show and tell. So this one. Oh, the, let's see, the Addis, I think. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And they're, yeah, they're super cute. Perfect. They kind of look like a, a hipster shoe, so. <laughs> awesome. Um, 
I guess, yeah, I hadn't realized that the Soul of Africa ones specifically were, were wider. Um, that's good to know. Thanks for filling me in. Um, let's see. This guy in the middle, top middle, is a Hintza out of the Czech Republic. And then these two are Lems. Um, this bottom left one is... Uh, kind of a good shoe. It's more of a transition shoe. So it does have some heel elevation. Um, and it is a little stiffer. So shoes are built on a spectrum, right? One end's kind of like a stiletto high heel and the other end is just going barefoot or like a Vibram five finger with like next to no padding. Um, so, you know, this lens here in the bottom left is by no means anywhere near a stiletto high heel. Um, but, you know, the healthiest shoe out of all of these would, you know, the, the Lemp boulder boot is super, super wide. Ahinsa is definitely super wide. Um, you know, it depends on your foot for these particular Vivos. Um, and obviously sandals are, there's, there's no constriction there. So um, that's an important thing when I'm talking with folks about shoes is, again, if we can make any improvement, that's a win. Um, and as Carrie mentioned, right, your toes are going to start letting you know when you wear shoes that aren't good. Uh, we reawaken those nerves and we start spreading the toes. And then you put a shoe on that pinches them again. And that shoe, you probably could wear that shoe comfortably for like 40 hours, you know, a 40 hour work week. But now because you've shown it what, what healthy is, it's going to let you know really fast that it doesn't want you to wear that. Um, so, you know, that, that scares a lot of people. So they're like, oh, I, these are the shoes. How am I, what do you mean? I'm not going to be able to wear them. So um, I definitely tell people take things slow, right? We're going to slowly transition um, or maybe you won't completely transition at all. You know, some people try and kind of do a little bit of both. Um, it's the people that try and like wear correct toes around the house for a few hours each day, but still wear really pointy shoes all day long and are, you know, they're not going to see their bunion change because they're spending so much more time in the shoe that is putting their big toe in a bunion configuration as opposed to the correct toes that are helping trying to reverse it. So um, back to kind of the transition shoes, uh, that's always the place to start. People are more willing to wear an ugly, running shoe, in my experience, than they are willing to wear uh, a work shoe or, you know, a, a social, you know, going out socially wearing a shoe that's, quote, ugly, or a duck shoe or a clown shoe. Um, so I didn't actually make a slide, but um, I do remote consultations with folks. Um, have worked with, I think, one so far. Um, person in the healthy living community. Um, we had a great chat. Um, and those are just on the website. And essentially the whole point of those are to, where are you today? Um, do you have like a foot ailment? Most of the time people come and chat with me, they're having some sort of foot pain or they've heard about this barefoot thing or correct toes and know that the shoes they're wearing aren't necessarily the best for them. Um, you know, they want to ensure that they have happy, strong feet for the rest of their life. So um, kind of get a picture of where you are currently and then talk about how are we going to, essentially it's that transition process, coaching you through how do we, what new shoes do we get, kind of what's our timeline for, here's your current shoes, here's some new shoes, what is this, what does that look like, how long should that take, um, what should you expect during this process, uh, what, what's your body going to tell you if you're going too fast. Um, those sorts of things. Um, and I know we've got, I think, a discount code for folks who are in the community. So um, definitely don't. Uh, yeah, we've got, we've got discounts there as well. And here are a bunch of citations. Um, yeah, I guess I'll conclude with like the citations, right? The lovely thing about all this is it's just human anatomy. It isn't like this is how I feel or, oh, the shoe's going to fix you because of this. It's just like if you put the foot in the right position, we're respecting your body's anatomy, and the body tends to do better when we do that as opposed to uh, 
that's a strong word, but deform our toes and feet. So, so yeah. I will stop the screen share. Okay, that took me took a little longer than I expected, but it's fun. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> yeah, no. um, if anybody has any questions, I would love to chat. I have a question. So, um, some people in healthy living community, like cost is definitely an issue, right? And so buying new shoes, like when I've talked to patients about, hey, we should really talk about switching your shoe wear. Um, yep. The finances behind that are a concern. So um, the thought that came to my mind when you were talking about like a transition shoe with the goal of then getting to a different shoe as the ideal, um, like for some people, really they can't afford that. So they could probably afford to say, I'm gonna choose a shoe. And if the end goal is a lens or you know something, they don't really care about the aesthetics, but they can afford a shoe, right? Or a pair. Yep. Hopefully not just one shoe. That would be that would be awkward. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess so my question is within that, I'm presume we, that's doable if, and it would just probably be kind of a longer, slower process over time. Right. Is that inaccurate? Assessment? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So there's a couple, couple pieces to this. So um, you said it perfectly. If we, if we get a shoe like a LEMS, so not necessarily a transition shoe, um, and I like shoe like LEMS or Bevo because uh, tradition like running shoes like ultra the padding will break down and that you know ultra will tell you well that's it's time to buy a new shoe so part of you know running shoes company's model is that their shoes break down so you have to keep buying them but if you buy a shoe like a lems that is just rubber or vivo barefoot this is just rubber obviously it breaks down eventually but they last so much longer there isn't this foam that's just going to break down over a few months um, so cost effective wise, shoes with less padding, uh, they, la they last longer. Um, so if we kind of skip that transition period and go straight to like a LEMS, you said it exactly, right? We're just good. That transition process is just going to take longer. So the beauty of the Ultra is because it's, it's, it's less of a jump away from the, what they're used to wearing, that they can transition into that Ultra faster. So if we move into something like a LEMS, you know, I don't know perfect timelines, but let's say they could have transitioned into an ultra like full time. They, they no longer wear Nikes. All of their activities are in ultra. They could do that in six weeks. Whereas it would take them 12 weeks to do that in a LEMS. You know, very rough, rough estimate timelines here, but it'll just take a little longer. Um, Cause the, right, we're just, if this is what they're used to, this is the ultra, the lens is even further down the road. So we just, we just slow things down. The most accessible thing for folks is just kicking their shoes off. So that's obviously free. So where I always recommend is starting around the house, just if you're used to, if you're used, shod, if you, if you wear shoes around the house, just slowly start taking your shoes off a little bit more and more and more. Um, a lot of people tend to wear shoes around the house or at least some sort of slipper. Um, so slowly increasing your barefoot time is an easy and obviously super cost effective way to get your feet accustomed to natural. Um, that can be an issue if someone's having like pointed pain, like on the bottom of the half capsulitis, it's going to probably be it's going to get pissed off by spending barefoot time because you're right on that, on the ground. Um, so obviously it's dependent on what exactly is going on. And then finally, you know, there are cheaper shoes, just like there are in the traditional world, um, shoe world. There are, there are shoes that are cheaper. Um, so, you know, I've worked with folks, you know, sending them kind of some of the cheapest things I can, I can come across. Um, Crocs are fantastic. They last for eternity and they're like 35 bucks or something like that. So Crocs are some of my favorites. Um, so yeah, there, there are definitely ways to work, work around it. Um, 
you know, it's easier if someone can buy multiple shoes, obviously, but, you know, I've worked with plenty of folks that we, you know, we have a budget and we got to stick to it. Um, so we can definitely, we can definitely do that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How long have you been wearing Vivos, Kat? Um, uh, four, four years. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, I, I trans. So I, I had very flat feet, and I was in custom orthotics, and I okay. firstly transitioned my wife to Vivos, and then since she was fine, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I went straight in, and I just walked really slowly for a few weeks. I was like, I'm Perfect. not running. I'm not going to run in this because I know I'll hurt myself. Uh huh. Um, and I just walked really slowly, and then I have arches now, which I never had in my life. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, the I think we found maybe two percent of our patient population truly needed some sort of arch support. So they're the person, like let's say you, like you've been used to arch support for a long time. We slowly wean you out of said arch support. We put you into shoes that actually hold your foot in the position it's meant to. We put you into correct toes so that the big toe is out where it's supposed to be. Um, because as the big toe sits out further, that arch inherently lifts up some. Um, if that person still has issues over pronating, even after doing that, you know, giving it some time too, giving them a month or two or even three months and they're still over pronating, then that's the person that we will put some sort of arch support in, in addition to their correct toes and shoes that hold them and anatomically correct. Yeah. Um, but you are like most people that we saw, right? 98% of people, your foot, there was nothing wrong with your foot. It had just been put in a position that was not very advantageous. Um, yeah, I mean, I found that I ha it has to be Vivos. That has to be, I can't have any, there can't be any cushion or I will go flat. If I can't feel exactly where my foot is on the ground, I'm flat. Right, awesome. Yeah, those, those proprioception, all those nerve endings need to know what's going on under there. Cool. That's perfect. Definitely tell your friends. <laughs> oh, I do. And I got my chiropractor to switch. Really? Nice yes. job. And, then, and, and he stopped selling orthotics and he's telling everybody to wear barefoot shoes, but no, they don't believe him. They would believe him for orthotics, but they won't believe him about barefoot shoes. They just... Yeah, it's a, it's a big, big paradigm shift for folks. Um, especially a lot of people have invested a lot of money into their orthotics or their healthy shoes. Um, you know, it's hard as a human being to have invested a bunch of money and time and effort into these things that are supposed to be healthy. You know, I bought the healthiest shoes for me so that I could, you know, run around with my grandkids. And then someone tells you those are actually really bad for you. Um, in my experience, lots of people get kind of defensive about, which makes total sense, right? It's like, oh, I've done something wrong. But you know, I tell them like, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. Like, you were trying to do the best you possibly could. Um, so, anyways. But yeah, and I'm I'm used to that experience of. Uh, because it's such a paradigm shift for folks that they immediately shut off when I tell them, I, I, you know, I, I, my spiel has gotten a little softer and a little better and depends who I'm talking to um, over the years. When, you know, I first started this, I was like, everyone needs to know this. <laughs> I get combative with people when they would tell me, no, I, I need my art support. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously that didn't work very well. So I, I ch changed my tone a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> have you come across katie bowman she's got absolutely yeah that's yeah amazing. i would say like once a week someone would come in because they found uh dr mcclanahan and the correct toes in a katie bowman book yeah <laughs> um and uh mcclanahan and bowman i don't know if they anyways you know yeah there are i'm sure she would say and uh, Ray, Dr. McClanahan will say the same. He's like, this isn't my stuff. Like other people are saying the same stuff because it's just like, it's the human body. Like I didn't come up with this information. Um, he's like, yeah, I, uh, I like how every year she, you know, updates the shoe list and she, uh, her 
uh, December ad movement advent calendar is always fun. Oh, cool. Like, does it on Facebook. There's a new move each day for December. Nice. I should yeah. check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my, one of my goals for the website is definitely to get a, a more comprehensive shoe list. Um, Cause like I said, like that's the hardest part for people is finding the shoes, making the jump with the shoes. Um, I've talked about this with Carrie. It's like, how do we get you into any shoe and have you spend enough time in it that it kind of sinks its teeth into you and you can't go back? Cause then your feet are like, Oh, these shoes, why would I wear these? These hurt. <laughs> so it's like, how do I get you to wear a good shoe just long enough that your brain is telling you, I don't want to do that anymore. Let's keep, let's keep going that direction. But it's that, it's that, it's that initial leap that is the hardest to kind of get people to do, but. Yeah, Katie Bowman, it's great. Well, Camden, I really appreciate you doing this talk and I'm excited for future ones. I'm gonna need to leave because I actually have another um, meeting I have to go to. But okay. you, now that you're host, you can do what you all will. So if you and Kat want to chat more or if there's other questions, feel free. Um, and then if you want to get me the recording and I can get it um, somewhere for community members and things like that. That would be That'd awesome. be great. So that would be great. great. Awesome. So I'm gonna leave and let you all close as you will. But thank you so all right. much. Sounds really good. Really appreciate it. It was great. Thanks, Carrie. Well any more questions from anyone else? Nope. Okay. Cool. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for coming. Yeah. It was fun to go over the basics again cool yeah i mean you, yeah you probably already knew all this stuff so yeah but i heard to hear it again <laughs> well well cool um enjoy the rest of your sunday you too and Daval, you too enjoy or dab all you know whatever cool all right see ya